Well, uh, Nehemiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 13 is where we'll be at this morning. Uh, last week we finished up chapter 4. Uh, if you're new with us, we're journeying through the book of Nehemiah uh, slowly, but hopefully thoroughly and uh, gleaning all that is there for us. Uh, today in chapter 5, we'll see some conflict and uh, opposition more within the, the people of Israel. We've looked at some opposition that's come up from without the nation, uh, outside the walls uh, of Israel. Uh, this week looking more at uh, how people are interacting with one another. So uh, we'll be dis- discussing that today. Nehemiah 5, 1 to 13, as uh, we pr- prepare to read through this, let me just speak a word of prayer uh, as we begin. Well, Father God, uh, here we are, uh, a new week, a new day. Um, and you still remain, your word remains, and uh, we're coming to it now and just uh, pray for the ability to shape ourselves around your word and uh, that it would uh, form who we become. God, uh, use your spirit to penetrate into the deepest places of our being as we looked at last week. Your word uh, is sharper than a two-edged sword and uh, divides soul and spirit, judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. So God, we pray that uh, that would be accomplished today. So we commit this time to you, invite you to uh, work in our hearts, our minds, um, how you see fit, and uh, give us the ability to respond as you desire. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Nehemiah 5, 1 through 13. It says, Now there arose a great outcry of the people and of their wives against their Jewish brothers. For there were those who said, With our sons and our daughters we are many, so let us get grain that we may eat and keep alive. There were also those who said, We are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our houses to get grain because of the famine. There were also those who said, We have borrowed money for the king's tax on our fields and our vineyards. Now our flesh is as the flesh of our brothers, and our children are as their children. Yet we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves, and some of our daughters have already been enslaved. But it is not in our power to help it, for other men have our fields and our vineyards. Nehemiah says, I was very angry when I heard their outcry in these words. I took counsel with myself, and I brought charges against the nobles and the officials. I said to them, You are exacting interest, each from his brother. And I held a great assembly against them and said to them, We, as far as we are able, have bought back our Jewish brothers who have been sold to the nations. But you even sell your brothers, that, you may be, that they may be sold to us. They were silent. They could not find a word to say. So I said, The thing that you are doing is not good. Ought you not to walk in the fear of our God to prevent the taunts of the nations, our enemies? Moreover, I and my brothers and my servants are lending them money and grain. Let us all abandon this exacting of interest. Return to them this very day their fields, their vineyards, their olive orchards, their houses, and the percentage of money, the grain, the wine, and the oil that you have been exacting from them. Then they all said, We will restore these, and we will require nothing from them. We will do as you say. And I called the priests, and I made them swear to do as they had promised. I also shook out the fold of my garment, and I said, So may God shake out every man from his house and from his labor who does not keep this promise. So may he be shaken out and emptied. And all the assembly said, Amen. And they praised the Lord, and the people did as they had promised. So uh, a lot going on there, 13 verses, uh, plenty that we could look at today. What's happening in this text? Clearly, uh, I'll give a little summary here, uh, establish a foundation. We see that the families working on the wall are really struggling because these men who had been called to work and build the wall of Jerusalem uh, presumably had to leave some sort of work that they were doing before. So the labor they were doing before, they're no longer to, uh, able to do. And this is really leading to, to even their wives coming out to the leader, Nehemiah, and complaining that they don't have the ability to eat food, they don't have the ability to pay taxes, because people from Israel are oppressing them. They can't eat uh, because of this apparent famine. They're mortgaging their fields, their vineyards, and their homes to get money just to pay their taxes. And it's so bad, it's to the point that even their children, their sons and their daughters, are being sold into slavery. Nehemiah hears about this, and he's ticked, right? 
He takes counsel with himself. It says verse 6 and 7. We can imagine that he's probably thinking. Uh, he's processing this, how he's going to respond. We look at the history of Nehemiah's life. It's safe to assume that he's praying during this time. And how does he respond? He goes straight to the source, right? He goes straight to the nobles and the officials, the people who are well off. And he makes one statement to begin with. He says, you are exacting interest from your brothers. Silence. The people had nothing to say in response. You can feel the awkwardness that must have come into that conversation as he makes this, uh, this accusation, and they're just speechless. They have nothing that they can say in return. Uh, he goes straight to them. Now, this exacting of interest, the reason they don't say anything in return, the reason they're speechless is because they recognize that Nehemiah is right, and they know God's word from the past, and they know that exacting interest from their own brothers is not advisable. Uh, they would have known Exodus twenty two twenty five. It says this, If you lend property to a person among you who is needy, a person among you, a, a, and a fellow Israelite for us today, a person of God's family, if you're lending them something, do not treat it like a business deal. Charge no interest. Deuteronomy 23, 19. Do not charge a fellow Israelite interest, whether on money or food or anything else that may earn interest. The idea here is that the people of God interact differently with each other. It's not a business transaction that we're setting up. This is a relationship of love, a relationship of trust. We see scripture says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. So if we make a commitment to each other, we're meant to trust each other and to set each other up uh, for success at that time. We deal with each other differently. Maybe even more frustrating than this financial abuse that's taking place is the reality that people of Israel were being sold into slavery. Nehemiah says, verse 8, he says, We're buying them out of slavery only to see you turn around and sell them back into slavery. Nehemiah is probably buying children back from slavery that his own Israelite community sold into slavery. You can see how much they're working against each other. And that led him to say, uh, you know, that they were being taunted, right? The, the other nations were taunting the people of Israel. This reminds me uh, of a story I heard about a missionary team in the Middle East. Uh, a team of Christian missionaries doing ministry in the Middle East to reach uh, Muslims. They, they chose to build a hotel. They needed a source of income to fund their ministry. They built a hotel, and the people who were staying in this hotel were primarily from the Muslim community, uh, and they were construction workers who were building in that area. And the reality was that every profit from that hotel, 100% of the proceeds was going to fund this ministry that the Christians were uh, practicing in that area. So the reality here is the Muslim community is funding the Christian ministry. They're uh, in a real way working against their own Christian community, right? They're funding uh, the, the Christian community. And you can see that that's Great work, great strategy, right? You have uh, that community fund the ministry that you are doing there, and it, it's had to have been somewhat comparable to a more uh, exaggerated extent here at the time of Israel. The people outside of Israel buying a child to work for them. They let them work for a time, and then they sell them back to the same nation of people for a higher price. The Israelites were acting foolishly, this is exactly why Nehemiah in verse 9, he says, Ought you not to walk in the fear of our God to prevent the taunts of the nations who are our enemies? It's interesting there that they're to walk in the fear of God in order to prevent the taunts of the nations who are around them. What's Nehemiah do when he finds out all this is happening again? He goes straight to the people uh, who are causing the offense. It's a great expression of his leadership. Uh, it wasn't a comfortable conversation, I'm sure, but it was an effort to establish unity and God-honoring behavior in that in that uh, community. So as we look at this text today, we have the background, we understand a little bit uh, about what's happening here. What were some of the main problems that this issue was causing? Why was it such a problem that Nehemiah had to go to them and confront them and ask them to stop doing this? Uh, why was their behavior so acceptable, I think, or unacceptable? I think there's many reasons why. Two big problems I see. One, their behavior was putting their fellow Israelites in harm's way. 
their behavior, what they were doing was allowing their brothers and sisters of faith and of their community to be in danger. They couldn't eat because of it. They were risking starvation and they were potentially being sold into slavery. Secondly, their behavior was damaging the reputation of God's people and their ability to show the world a strong united testimony. They were damaging the ability of that community uh, to be an expression of God's, uh, what God has called us all to. So how does this impact us today? In what way can we relate to this text that's happening thousands of years of, ago? How does it uh, impact us today? I want to look at a few verses from the New Testament to draw some parallels here. Romans 6, verse 17 Paul, right into Christian people, followers of Christ. He says, you were once enslaved to sin. You were once slaves to sin. Every person here who has been saved by the grace of Jesus Christ it was once enslaved to sin. Scripture would say, you were dead in your sin. 1 Corinthians 6.20, you are not your own. You were bought at a price. We were bought at a price. We were living in slavery. We were in bondage to sin. That was the slavery that we were bound up in. But we were bought out of that into freedom at a price. What is the price that was given? We know it's the price of Jesus Christ's life on the cross. He gave everything so that we can have an opportunity to be set free. And isn't that comparable to what's happening in the text? Nehemiah literally bought people out of slavery because he wanted them to know joy and peace and contentment within a community. Jesus literally bought us out of slavery because he wanted us to know joy and peace and contentment and a faith community along with one another. A couple more passages. Romans 14. This is a, a paraphrase here. Don't be a stumbling block to another believer. If your brother or sister in faith is grieved by what you eat, you're not walking in love. Don't destroy the one who Christ has died to save. It says the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating or drinking. It's a matter of righteousness, peace, and joy. So do not for the sake of food destroy the work of God. It is not good to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother or your sister in faith to stumble. What does this mean? He's saying, don't do anything that could set your brother or sister in faith up to fail. Don't set them up for failure. Set them up for success. Don't set them up into an environment where they could run into trouble. Set them up where uh, they can succeed. Now, this is exactly what the nobles and the officials were not doing. Right? They were not helping their fellow Israelites be successful. They were putting them into a situation where they could be destroyed, where they could fail. Again, we see the Old Testament is a physical expression of this spiritual reality. We saw it last week with the sword. The men were carrying these swords to defend themselves as they worked on the wall. That's a physical expression of the spiritual reality, the spiritual sword the Word of God that we all have to defend ourselves. This week, the physical expression is people who are potentially being sold back into slavery, starvation. They're facing all of these issues, the spiritual reality. We could all fall back into slavery to sin. We could starve spiritually. So we see here uh, the Old Testament, a physical expression of this spiritual reality. And Jesus took this issue of falling back into sin, of allowing someone to be sold back into slavery, to fall away, to stumble. He took it very seriously. He knew the effects of uh, of sin, the importance of fleeing it. Luke 17, verse 2, Jesus says, it would be better for them to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around their neck than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. Wow, that's pretty intense language. It's better to be physically dead than to allow someone to stumble spiritually. Jesus is after the exact same thing Nehemiah is after, right? Don't put your brothers and your sisters in faith in a position where they may be unsafe, where they could fail. Set each other up for success. Protect one another. One more passage. This relates to the idea of us being a strong, united testimony for the other nations to observe. You remember in Nehemiah, it said the other nations were taunting them because they were not living in unity. They were working against each other. Listen to this, 1 Peter 2, verse 12. 
live such good lives among non-believers that even though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day that he visits us. Don't live a life that contradicts scripture, that contradicts other people in the body of believers that can give people grounds for accusations. Don't justify their accusations. Live such a good life among the people who are not yet believers that when Christ comes, they have no, uh, nothing to respond with except for to praise God because they recognize that he was truly living through, through you. Now, all of this, it forced Nehemiah to ask them, why are you all taking this ridiculous amount of interest from the people you're called to love? Why are you letting them starve? Why are you setting them up to fail? Why are you selling people into slavery that we just bought out of slavery? You're sending people that you're supposed to be loving back into slavery. He says plainly, the thing you are doing is not good. These wealthy people they saw the hardships of others as an opportunity for personal success. They turned one person's struggle into their personal gain. They had no fear of God, right? They only had a desire for personal success and prosperity. And their lack of faith, we really see lack of faith led to selfishness. Lack of fear of God led to selfishness. And their selfishness was putting their Jewish brothers and sisters in a position to fail. And the same is true for each of us today. Our selfishness is not only an issue between us and God. It's also between us and the person that we are neglecting to love. Whenever we live selfishly, we always withhold blessing or encouragement from another person. Isn't that what selfishness is? When we consume what should have or could have been offered to someone else, I have a, a story to illustrate this, a small-scale example of the same reality. We were at the zoo, smoking hot, as it seems to always be when you choose to go to the zoo. Stephanie and I are wondering if it's a good idea or a bad idea to have brought our children out in this. They're hot. They're getting tired. They're hungry. And apparently the lions and the camels and the manatees are not as cool uh, when the kids are hot and hungry and uh, ready to go. And I see this dad as we're walking. He's got his, his family there, and he takes his son over to this place that's selling popcorn and ice-cold drinks. So as he had a couple girls, his wife were over here, brought his son over, and I'm thinking, man, that might be a good idea uh, just to solve this problem that's, that's beginning to surface here. Uh, but I didn't want to spend $30 on popcorn and a drink, so I stood my ground. Uh, but I... <laughs> I see this man walk back with his son, and his son's got this huge bag of popcorn. He's got a smile on his face. And you know, as soon as he got back to the family, those two little girls, they wanted some of the popcorn, right? Because they're starving. They're hungry too. They're feeling the same pain that their brother was feeling. But you know, he didn't want to share any of that popcorn. He just wanted it for himself. So you can imagine what starts happening. Accusations start flying. Fingers are being pointed. People are trying to figure out uh, who's going to get some of this popcorn. Popcorn. Finally, the father steps in. He lets them know that, hey, buddy, uh, you're going to have to share this. It's for everyone, not just yourself. Now, what happened there? Uh, the boy's father purchased him a gift that he gave him to satisfy the need that he was feeling, his hunger, his frustration. He was hot. He got him a cold drink. Two minutes ago, this boy had nothing. Now he's on cloud nine. But he doesn't want to share any of it. He doesn't care about anybody else. He could have shared half the bag and still had half the bag for himself. And everybody could have been happy. Isn't that what the sinful nature constantly tells us? Just keep it for yourself. Life's too short. Live it up. Consume while you can. Enjoy while you can. That's what the nobles and the officials were doing. How'd they become wealthy? God gifted them with blessing. They were given this blessing from God. All that we have is from God, right? If we think it's ours to use however we want, then we're way off base. They weren't going to share. They just wanted more. Now, what's the testimony that that creates for the world to see? Look at this family at the zoo. 
That family was a wreck for a couple minutes, right? The parents are scrambling, trying to, to prevent embarrassment as other people walk by and they see their kids just going at each other. That's, uh, that was not uh, an expression of generosity or love. It was marked by greed and discontentment. It's the same for us when we set others up to fail. When we don't live selflessly, it's not pretty. It's not the image that God desires us to give to the world. Every time we are selfish, someone pays the price. Someone always suffers when we are selfish. When we excessively consume the resources that could satisfy another person's needs, it's not a beautiful expression of God's love. And we're tempted to say, well, it's their price to pay. They need to put in some hard work. They need to figure it out. I worked hard for what I have, right? I value the little free time that I get with my family. My family needs this time together. We deserve this. And I've been there deciding whether or not to offer up valuable resources. Our time, money, family, energy, emotions, your living room. And then on the good days, I'm reminded of Jesus. Praise God that Jesus didn't look at us as we were left in desperate need of help and a Savior. And praise God, He didn't tell God that we just need to put in some extra hard work and we need to figure things out on our own. Praise God that Jesus didn't keep the excess of God's grace all to Himself, but He chose to pour it out to those who were in need, saved by grace, selfless grace, saved every single one of us, and that's what we're called to be imitators of. It's a call to live with sacrificial love. Doesn't that even just sound so much better? Isn't it such a much more beautiful expression of who Christ is, of what the gospel message is? It's such a more attractive expression of kingdom living. Sacrificial love is the only way that we, as a church body, are going to protect one another from falling in to harm's way. That's the model that Jesus gave us. He gave everything so that we could be saved. It's the model that Nehemiah is giving. He gave his own resources to buy people out of slavery so that they could again be free. John 15, 13, it says, Greater love has no one than this, that he would lay down his life for his friends. That's a powerful statement. That's a beautiful statement, isn't it? A beautiful image. Laying down your life so that someone else may be set free. Can any marriage or friendship survive or thrive without sacrificial love? Can any family survive or thrive without sacrificial love at its foundation? Can any church build up spiritual leaders, grow disciples of Christ without expressing sacrificial love? It's essential, isn't it? At least for a good, healthy organism, it's essential. So look around this room. Someone down the pew, the other side of the sanctuary. Here's the question that God asked me as I was looking through the text this week. Do you care for the spiritual well-being of the people in this room more than you care for your own personal success and comfort in this world? I'll ask it another way. Would you sacrifice worldly success and comfort to help protect the spiritual well-being of the people in this room and to strengthen our testimony of God's church in this community in this area of Ohio? So I asked myself, this is, scriptures, uh, this is surfacing out of the text, I asked myself, I want to invite each of you who are committed to this church, who are committed to following after Christ, I asked, how am I loving the people of this church sacrificially? Or at least some of the people. None of us can adequately love all the people of this church sacrificially. How am I loving at least a few people in this church sacrificially? Now, is it fair to say that this text is suggesting sacrificial love? Maybe we're taking this too far. What did Nehemiah request of the officials? Did he say just give back the interest? Just give back the excess. No, he says give it all back. Verse 11, give them back their fields, their vineyards, their orchards, the homes, the money, the grain, the wine, and the oil. Give it all back. You don't need any of it. 
You are completely fine. He says, just let them use it while you're capable of supporting them through this time of need. The other option is that they starve or that they're sold into slavery. Just let them use the possessions as you're able. And if that's not enough to support the thought that Nehemiah was advocating for sacrificial love, we only need to look at the way that he lived his life as a leader in the community, and we presume he would expect from others in the community. How did all of this begin? Chapter 1, Nehemiah gave up his position as cupbearer to the king. That was a high position. Traveled 400, uh, 900 miles, four months, To be with those people who were being attacked by enemies, it wasn't safe. That was a sacrifice on his part. He took the brunt of the opposition from all of these leaders. He didn't have to sign up for that. Uh, Chapter 5, verse 8, he's purchasing people out of slavery with his own resources. Verse 10, he's lending money to the people who are in need. And next week, we'll look at servant leadership. And we see the uh, large expression uh, that Nehemiah was loving sacrificially. It says he doesn't, the king, Artaxerxes, was giving Nehemiah food. Nehemiah didn't eat any of the food. He gave it all away. He worked on the wall alongside of the people. He brought his own servants who worked on the wall alongside of the people. He fed over 150 people from the surrounding nations with his own resources. He gave them an ox, six sheep, and birds every single day from his own resources. Every 10 days, he provided them with wine. And he didn't ask for anything in return. He just gave it generously. His time, his money, his energy, his relationships, his power, his influence, his livestock, he gave it all to protect the well-being, the safety of the people of Israel. Galatians 6.10 says, Let us do good to one another, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. See, there's a special place in our lives for the family of believers. So what does this look like for us in rural Ohio? As we live here in these small towns, I believe that we're living in a time that's overflowing with opportunity to see churches renewed and vibrant faith and lost people reached with the gospel of Christ. Because it's not going to be too long before the strategies, the theories, and the worldviews of our society prove themselves to be incapable of providing a solid foundation. There's going to be a huge opportunity for the gospel of Christ to slide into that area and provide answers in people's lives. And if we want to participate in that, we have to be willing to love sacrificially. So two ways uh, I believe that we can do this in this area. The ways probably are infinite and encourage you to think about how may you love someone in this place sacrificially? How can you make sure that people are being set up to be safe and that we can have a a united testimony for God in this community? Uh, I encourage you to think about that. Two two ideas I thought of. One, excuse me, invest in a person or a family that does not have biological family nearby. We're all family, right? That's cliche. It's Bible language, faith family. It's true, right? We're a spiritual family. Ephesians 4, one Lord, one spirit, one faith, one baptism. We're all united as a family. So I encourage you to think creatively about how you could be a blessing to someone in this area that is so tight-knit. Many communities still have a lot of family nearby. That's where we fill our free time with, is with our family. And the domino effect there is that people who move to this area who are new to the area and do not have biological biological family nearby are neglected. They need relationship. They need support. Raising children can be difficult. Marriage Marriage can be difficult. We need to find ways to support those individuals. If they have young children, babysit their kids for free. Invite them to lunch. Share some meals. Be intentional around the holidays. You know, life can be difficult. Now, this is a strategic way for us to ensure that we are supporting the people of faith in this community. It's also a strategic way for us to reach out to someone who might not yet have any faith or might not yet believe in God because there's plenty of people coming to this community from all over that aren't in a church, but they're still desiring community. They still don't have family to support them, and that gives us an opportunity to identify those individuals, to love them and support them, to reveal uh, the gospel into their lives. Number two, 
Identify the person or people in this church that you will love sacrificially. So as I said, none of us are capable of loving everyone in the church body sacrificially, but every one of us is able and expected by Christ, I believe, to love someone or some people in the church sacrificially. You see uh, Acts, it says 3,000 people were added to the church at one time. What else? Those people, were they didn't have any needs that were unmet, right? Everybody's needs were being met. They didn't know everyone. There's no way they could have, but they all knew someone, and they made sure that their needs were all being met. The New Testament alone has almost 60 mentions of one another's, to love one another, to lay down your life for one another. It's the second greatest commandment, to love one another. Uh, we are built for community. We're built for a relationship to be connected with other people. It's not always easy. It's not what we want to do, but that doesn't mean that it's not good. The spiritual well-being of our brothers and sisters in faith depends on it. The testimony of faith that we have in this community and the surrounding communities depends on it. Now the nobles and the officials, they heard what Nehemiah said. He communicated this and they said, you're right. They recognized that deep down with inside themselves that Nehemiah was right, that they were being selfish, that they were withholding what they could have given to someone else and they committed to follow through. They committed to return it all to other people. Nehemiah shook out his garments. He says, let this be a reminder, this image here, that God would shake all of us out who aren't willing to live for the other, who aren't willing to live for God. And that's the same call we have on our lives, that we would be willing to serve one another, that we would be willing uh, to support others in need. So as we close this morning, uh, I'll close this with prayer. I want to give just a couple minutes for us to spend with the Lord. Uh, maybe prayerfully consider someone in this church, uh, a family, a group of people uh, that you could connect with and support in a powerful way, that you would be willing to invest into their lives. So think of someone in the community who may need that in their life. So take a couple minutes, think about that. Uh, you can spend time in prayer if you'd like, and I'll close us shortly.